everyone. This is the Crime Cafe, your podcasting source of great crime, suspense, and thriller writing. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I bring on my guest, I'll just remind you that the Crime Cafe has two ebooks for sale the nine book box set and the short story anthology. You can find the buy links for both on my website, debbiemack.com, under the Crime Cafe link. You can also get a free copy of either book if you become a Patreon supporter. You'll get that and much more if you support the podcast on Patreon, along with our eternal gratitude for doing so. But first, let me put in a good word for Blueberry Podcasting. I'm a Blueberry affiliate, but that's not the only reason I'm telling you this. I've been using Blueberry Podcasting as my hosting service for my podcast for years, and it's one of the best decisions I ever made. They give great customer service, you're in complete control of your own podcast, you can run it from your own website, and it just takes a lot of the work out of podcasting for me. I find for that reason that it's a company that I can get behind 100% and say, you should try this. Try Blueberry. It doesn't require a long-term contract, and it's just a great company, period. And it also has free technical support by email, video, and phone. So you can get a human being there. Isn't that nice? Hi, everyone. Our guest today is the author of the Eli Marks Mystery Series. He also writes the Como Like Players Mystery Series under the pen name Bobby Raymond. Bobby Raymond, I believe I have that right. In addition to three standalone novels, he has written several books about low-budget filmmaking. Now, that's an interesting subject. Um, Coming to us from Minnesota, my guest today is John Gaspard. Hi, John. Did I pronounce that correctly? (laughs) You you did. You pronounced it one of the two ways that is acceptable. uh, My wife is more persistent about wanting Gaspard, but I've always had Gaspard. So I go, I, I answer to either one. Gaspard. Very French? Yes. Oh, yes. It's like Smith in the phone book over there. All right. Okay. Um, by the way, I love the short story that you provided for your guest post. I Great, just want to say, I just want to say that if you out there have not read it, any listeners have not read it, I would highly recommend you go to my blog and take a look at it. It's fun. And it even comes with an animated video, which I've loved. Um, it's on my blog, on my website, and it's a great way to sample John's writing and Eli Marks. Um, what prompted you to write this particular series about this kind of protagonist? Well, um, boy, that's a really good question. I had written a standalone um, uh, suspense novel called The Ripperologist about uh, people who are experts on Jack the Ripper who have to solve a, a current day recreation of the crimes. And I liked the process, but that particular story didn't have what I thought were a lot of legs. Um, I was a big fan of the writer Lawrence Block and the different series that he had, his Matthew Scudder series, which is pretty hard boiled. And then his Bernie uh, Rodenbar burglar series, uh, which is more lighthearted and a little goofier. Um, And I really liked that. I'd like something in that mold um, and was looking for uh, a hero. in the Ripperologist, there had been a dynamic of a, of a crotchety old expert and a, a younger whippersnapper guy, and I liked that. So uh, I created uh, Eli Marks, the magician, who's in his 30s, and his uncle Harry, who has essentially raised him, who's in his 80s. Uh, Harry is a master magician. He has worked in all forms of uh, professional stage magic, close-up magic, kids magic, big illusions, you name it, Harry's done it. Uh, and his nephew, Eli, is in his uh, early 30s and is a working magician, making his living doing birthday parties and corporate events and trade shows and that sort of thing. Nowhere near as uh, uh, successful or knowledgeable as Harry was, but he always has Harry uh, as a resource. Um, and the, I fell into magicians because as I was looking around and realized because I was at the time uh, in the meetings and events business uh, in the corporate world, I knew more magicians than the average person knew, and they were all pretty interesting, very creative, very smart, uh, a a little quirky, 
Um, and then I started investigating and found out that the names of their tricks, names that you might never hear, because a lot of times a magician doesn't say this is such and such a trick, they just do the trick. But the names themselves lent themselves to, I thought, pretty good mystery titles like the Ambitious Card, the Bullet Catch, the Miser's Dream, that sort of thing. So I sat down and started to study uh, and learn how to write like a magician. So I'm not a magician, uh, but I can write like one and I'm... Uh, a pretty good at um, making it sound like Eli knows what he's talking about and Harry knows what they're talking about. How did you get to know so many magicians? Well, I booked several of them uh, in the corporate world when I was doing meetings and events for companies. You'd have to have, uh, you know, after dinner entertainment and magicians are uh, always good for that sort of thing. And then a couple actor friends were also magicians and, um, I had about a half dozen people I knew who were professional magicians, uh, which is a lot more than the average person would have in their life who isn't at all involved in magic. Um, a whole lot more. I'm surprised if any of your listeners even uh, know one professional was magician personally. Uh, and it just seemed like a really good, interesting field. There was a lot of history to it. There's a lot of depth. And because he's a magician, uh, Eli is in a lot of different environments. He runs a magic store with his uncle. He does corporate events. He does trade shows. He finds himself in a lot of different situations uh, where murders or whatever happen. Uh, so he isn't homebound or anything like, you know, near a wolf or something. He is out in the world and is able to really do things and explore things. And, and that's what I liked about the magician. It, it, it's not a normal kind of a job because every time they do something, they're generally in a different environment. It's great. It's so esoteric, you know. Um, did you do a lot of research to get to know the magician trade? I did. I had to do a ton of research to get up to speed. Um, I had to. I, I understood that I was like that old joke about the two guys who are being chased by the bear, and one guy says the other one will never outrun that bear, and the other guy says, "I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you." And that's what it is with me and magic. I don't know as much as a magician, but I know more than the average person. And that's really all I need to know. But it's been a constant learning thing. I have to just keep learning stuff and filling the hopper for, you know, if, if Harry makes an offhand comment about a magician in the 20s, I need to know a magician in the 20s and I need to know something about him. So I did do a lot of reading. Uh, I went to some conventions. I, uh, there was a really good podcast uh, at the time called the Magic Newswire that had a lot of good interviews. Uh, and then I was very lucky that a world-class magician happens to live uh, about 10 minutes away from me. Her name is Suzanne. She's performed all around the world. She's, uh, you can see her at the Magic Castle uh, in Los Angeles a couple times a year. And she, she's been doing it for 20 years and she really knows her stuff. And she gives occasionally lessons. And so uh, I took about a dozen lessons from her uh, ostensibly to learn how to do the trick that is the, the title trick in the first book, The Ambitious Card, which is a card trick where the card that you, the volunteer, has chosen uh, keeps being buried in the deck of cards and then pops to the top on its own magically. So not only did she teach me the moves to do that, but I also was able to learn what it's like to be a full-time magician because that's her, her job. What are her concerns? What you know, uh, what keeps her up at night, what annoys her, what excites her. Um, and so even though I was writing a male character, the job was the same, whether it's male or female. Um, I learned a lot from Suzanne and we've become good friends since then. Uh, and that really gave me the footing that I needed. But like I say, I still listen to magic podcasts. I still read books. I still get magazines. Uh, I still have to keep learning stuff uh, in order to keep everything accurate. Because although the average reader wouldn't know whether I got something right or wrong. A magician reading it would, and they would uh, reach out, I'm sure, and let me know that I have uh, uh, described an effect wrong or have a slight wrong or something like that. But just the opposite has happened. In fact, I was very fortunate a couple of years ago, I got an email from Teller of Penn and Teller. Uh, he doesn't speak, but he does write emails. Uh, he had read one of the books and he wrote me the just nicest note saying uh, mostly uh, mysteries that involve magicians get the magic wrong. Uh, you did not. You, yours was accurate and true to life. And I really enjoyed that. So I figure if one of the top five magicians in the world has read the books and said the magic is correct, uh, then I'm doing the right kind of research. Oh, my God. That is 
the highest form of compliment right there. That is amazing. I could, I could retire at that point. That was kind of, we're not going to get any better than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are seven Eli Marks novels published so far, correct? There are seven. There's an eighth one coming out after the first of the year. Uh huh. I was going to ask about that. What's the latest one about? And is there kind of like a um, plan for the series in terms of how many books and where? No, that it? that the word plan doesn't even enter my mind. Anything like that? No, I wasn't even sure I was going to do one after the first one, but it's sort of. Uh, uh, kept evolving and there was stuff for Eli to do. Um, the series is fun in that you can really jump in anywhere um, because they're all freestanding. But if you do start at the beginning, you see an evolution between Harry and his uncle and Harry and his girlfriend and uh, Harry, uh, the stuff that goes on in Harry's life and in Eli's life. Uh, in fact, one of the books, the sixth book, which is called The Zombie Ball, is a flashback book which takes place before all of them uh, and sort of explains some tropes that have happened in all the books and why they've ended up that way. But for the eighth book, which is called The Self-Working Trick, uh, it's a, actually a collection of Eli Mark's short stories. One of the things that is mentioned a lot in many of the books is that Eli has helped the police uh, out on a number of cases in the past, but they, they sort of refer to them obliquely. Uh, and I thought it would be, might be kind of fun to uh, see what some of those cases were. So it's a, it's a dozen stories uh, that just show Eli at different stages in his life, uh, being involved in either their murders or hostage situations or robberies, uh, and just showing how, it, how the, uh, the things he knows how to do as a magician can sometimes help him solve crimes that the police can't figure out. Interesting. Um, do you find it hard to come up with situations in which an amateur sleuth, like a magician, would have to deal with solving a murder? Um, yes and no. It's a Jessica Fletcher kind of situation. Um, I did set it up that Eli's ex-wife is the uh, assistant district attorney, and she's now married to uh, uh, a detective in homicide. So there is sort of a connection that why he keeps stumbling into things and the fact that he has in the past helped them solve uh, unsolvable crimes does uh, make sense that they would come and ask him questions about particular cases. So yeah, the bigger problem I have is um, writing mysteries is hard as anyone who's ever done it will tell you, uh, particularly if you wanna write uh, a really fair mystery, and I don't mean fair in the sense of just barely good, I mean fair where you get to the end, you go, oh, that is both surprising and inevitable. Uh, that's, I know there are some people who can do it in their sleep. Uh, for me, it's really difficult. It's hard to, I don't have that kind of puzzle mind. And so putting those things together are the, the hardest parts of the books. And what I wanted to do with the self-working trick book number eight, uh, was do the hard part a dozen times, do 12 mysteries, um, and not worry about an entire novel around them. These are three to 6,000 word short stories, uh, in which the key is the mystery and the key is solving it. Uh, just to give myself some more practice in, in, um, getting out there and figuring out a mystery, uh, as opposed to the normal novel, which takes me like a year and a half to do, and it's mostly spent trying to figure out, I know who did it, but how is Eli going to figure it out and how is it going to be fair? I just sort of um, put that into hyperdrive and, and did it a dozen times for this book just to try to get better at it. Wow, well, that's a really great approach, actually. A great writing tip right there to work on short fiction. Well, you're supposed to do the stuff that scares you. And um, so that's what I did. I'm with you there. Short stories are hard. Um, they are so hard and they make it everywhere. Debbie, it's just people don't, they think, oh, you just knock off a short story. It's like, it's actually, I think, harder to write a good short story than to write a novel. Because with a novel, you've uh, you got a lot of places to play and goof around. And, you know, it's like taking a very long road trip and you can stop wherever you want. A short story is a trip to the store and back, and it's got to be really tight. Uh, and unfortunately, people have gotten in the habit of reading really, really great short stories where, you know, like uh, everything falls into place uh, and it just makes them so hard to do. So it, it was a, it was a good challenge to put myself uh, up for. Well, that's cool. Um, 
Also, you've written another series under a pseudonym. What inspired you to write that series? Why use a pseudonym? <clears throat> um, the, the simple answer is uh, back when, before I was self-publishing, um, I did have a traditional publisher. Uh, and I was told repeatedly that one of the reasons they were having trouble with the Eli Marx books was because it was a male protagonist uh, written by a male author, and that most cozy mysteries are female protagonists written by a female author. Uh, so I thought I'd test that out and just see, does it really make any difference? And I don't think it really does. Um, I had an idea to, to do a series in a community theater because uh, I've directed a bunch of community theater plays and have a pretty good have a better knowledge of that actually than of being a magician. Uh, and it lends itself to a series very nicely because although some of the main people at the theater stay the same, the cast and crew tends to change for every play. So you have a new cast every time. Uh, and I thought it'd be sort of a challenge to, to try to write a female character. Um, I made the choice to write it in third person because uh, I really didn't think I'd be very good at getting into, into her head. She's the executive director of the theater. Um, but from a third person point of view, I, I can represent her uh, pretty well. And it's it's a fun milieu. I mean, it's uh, plays are fun and, and it, they can be dark and mysterious. You got a lot of crazy characters. It's a, it's a fun place to play. Kind of a nice collaborative sort of setting too. I mean, in terms of having a lot of different characters, I assume. Yes, it it is so nice to um, uh, if if for all those writers out there who are writing mysteries and who get halfway through their book and realize that they've killed off all their suspects, which I have done, um, and you have to go back and add more people. Uh, if you've got you know the cast of a Christmas Carol, which is what the third book book will be about, you know I've got a dozen people there. Uh, I've got a lot of great suspects, a lot of people to kill. Uh, and it just makes it so much easier. The, the second book was all about the importance of being earnest, which is a cast of, I think, six or eight. Just ideal. It's just, and they were all people who weren't in the first book. Uh, so any one of them could have been the killer. Because, you know, once you've established a character in a book as, you know, moving from book to book, the, the odds of them being the killer in the second book are, are kind of slim. So you need a bunch of new faces and having a new play each book has been really helpful. That's brilliant, actually. That's great. Um, how did you get involved in low budget filmmaking? <laughs> um, I've been doing that for forever since about age 13. I was given a, a wind up movie camera by an uncle who was done using it and um, started doing shorts and then was lucky enough while in high school. There was a film program here in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, high school film program where you do your normal school work in the morning and then go off to a film program in the afternoon. So I did that for three years and made uh, a couple features in Super 8, which is kind of at the time, uh, even now, was pretty unheard of to do a 90 minute feature on a really wonky technology. And then I just kept doing it uh, in college. Uh, I took some film courses and, and had access to a lot of video equipment, made some features there. And then got out of college and a, a friend approached me and said he had a script that he'd written and he had $30,000 and he wanted to shoot it. Would I direct it? And I said, yes, I will direct your movie if you produce one with me afterwards. So we did two features on 16 millimeter, uh, each costing about $30,000. They've, uh, the first one, I don't think it's made any money back. The second one is maybe almost made money back. Um, and then, filmmaking kind of broke open when the digital realm came and, and cameras were cheap and, and you didn't have to pay for film. Uh, everything was digital, zeros and ones. Um, so you could shoot a lot. And I made uh, three features in a short that way. Uh, and it's just, it's very collaborative. It's really fun. It's, uh, it's exhausting and, and not for the uh, faint of heart or the young, or I mean the old. Uh, as I've gotten older, it's just, it's, it's a harder thing to do because there's a lot of gear and there's a uh, it's if if you've spent a year writing a novel, uh, imagine doing the same thing, but you've got to organize a dozen or twenty people every time you want to work on the next part of it, uh, and you get a sense of just what a huge task it is. But the upside is that uh, I learned a whole lot about storytelling, and how to uh, start a scene, and how to end a scene, and how to 
bury exposition and introduce characters and all that, which comes in very handy in novel writing. Very much so. I do screenwriting and have taken a course on indie producing. Mm -hmm. And it just opened my eyes to just how complex and amazing the filmmaking process is. It, they make it look easy. And um, <laughs> having done corporate events and done video production in the corporate side for 30 years, uh, the average person um, looking at a video would go, oh, well, that was you just shot that, right? And no, even today with equipment making things much easier, you, just, you still are setting up sound and setting up lights and doing different takes and different angles. And uh, it, it, it isn't as simple as it looks. That's right. Yeah. And there, there's so much, there's a whole team involved in making a movie. That's the thing. Yeah. It depends on your budget too. I mean, sometimes people can do more than one thing. Sometimes they do all of it. And it's really amazing what gets well, done. <laughs> you know, having done the uh, last couple of digital features I did, um, we did one that was actually shot in the theater that is the basis for the, the Bobby Raymond series. Uh, which is a little community theater in Minneapolis. And um, I worked with a, a screenwriter uh, and we looked at the building and went, there's 42 different rooms in this building. There's a lot of spaces in this building. Um, this building is used Friday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon. Um, it's, it's empty the rest of the time, except the rehearsal hall. Everything else is empty for the rest of the week. What a great place to make a movie. And so we wrote the movie to fit that space and those rooms and um and for that you know i was co-screenwriter and i was the director and i was also the cinematographer um, and that's a lot of jobs for one person to take on i was lucky to have a couple crew people who would help with the lights and uh, one guy who did the sound but even then it was a crew of maybe four people uh it it, it certainly can be done uh it just is pretty exhausting mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, there's pre-production, there's post-production. <laughs> People really just don't appreciate how much goes into it. No, they don't. They don't. Um, and th that's, you know, why I wrote a couple books on film production, just because uh, after we did our two 16 millimeter features, um, my producing partner and I went, we learned a lot of stuff in the first one, and then we forgot about half of it and had to relearn it on the second one. And we kept reinventing the wheel. Um, and so I, I did one book on just general production and one on screenwriting, as much for myself as for anyone else, just to remind myself of, you, it, here's a smart way to do things. You, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Someone else has already solved this problem for you. Mm -hmm, yeah. I'll definitely have to check out your books <laughs> on filmmaking, definitely. Um, what do you like to read and what authors inspire you? Well, I mentioned Lawrence Block uh, with his Matthew Scudder books and his uh, Bernie Rodenbar and his Keller, the, the very charming Hitman series. Um, he, he's, uh, he makes it look easy, particularly in his short stories, he really makes it look easy. Um, and so I learned a lot from, from reading him. Um, you know, when I started the series, I went back and, and reread a bunch of Agatha Christie's um, as much to see what I didn't want to do as what I did want to do to see how she buried things and hid things and set up things. Um, and uh, I wasn't always happy with her solutions, um, particularly having directed a couple of her plays where you just go that makes no sense at all um ma'am that makes no sense at all that you can do that but anyway so um I, I learned a lot from that um as for actual casual reading you know since i started in the series um i am spending so much time reading about magic uh that i don't have as much time for that sort of pleasure reading as i would like not that the me reading about magic isn't pleasurable some of it really really is because there's a lot of very smart people coming up with very clever ideas. Um, but yeah, it was Lawrence Block that really inspired me at the beginning. That's cool, because he's a great writer. I love his work. He is a fantastic writer. Um, what advice would you give to someone starting out as a writer? 
Well, it's the same advice I give to people starting out making movies, which is you have to decide <clears throat> early on if um, if this needs to be a, a money making operation or not. Um, I learned that a lot in filmmaking that toward the end there with digital filmmaking, you can do it so cheaply. I mean, for example, when we did our 16 millimeter features, I mentioned they cost $30,000 each, uh, which may not seem like a lot in Hollywood terms, but that's a lot in human terms, the regular people. Uh, and that went primarily for the gear and the film stock and processing the film stock and all that. Nowadays with the digital system set up the way they are and, and the digital recording for audio and the low budget uh, editing gear. Um, one of the last features I did, the one we did in the theater, which was called Ghost Light, um, the cost really, because I already own the camera and the lights, the costs were um, making sure that there was lunch every Saturday for the crew. Um, and I actually spent more money entering the film into film festivals than I did making the film because each film festival costs like 50 to 80 bucks to enter it. And, um, it that can, you can rack that up pretty quickly. So I, my advice is with writing or with filmmaking, decide early on uh, if you want economics to be a part of this or not. If you want economics to be a part of it, then you've got to create with that in mind. What do people want to read? How, how am I going to get it to them? How am I get money out of it? If you don't care about the economics and you just want to have an enjoyable time doing it, but still would like people to read stuff, um, it makes it a whole lot easier because as with filmmaking, getting a book out there now is really cheap. Uh, you, you obviously need a computer probably to write it on. Uh, it would be helpful if you had vellum or something like that to format it. You need to buy a really good cover from a really good graphic artist, don't make your own, um, and you have a good editor go through it. But, you know, if you're spending more than a thousand dollars, you don't, you don't have to is what I'm saying. And if that's all it costs, then you don't need to make more than a thousand dollars if you don't care about making money. The problem is, as with anything else, uh, it becomes a competition and you start reading about what other people are doing and it's like oh this person is selling this amount of books per day and why am i why am i not doing that well i'm not doing that because i don't care to do that i, I, I love it when someone buys you know I'll, I'll look online and go oh look somebody clearly bought all seven books in the eli mark series today someone went because all seven of them all, all sold at the same time so clearly someone bought all of them that's fantastic i'm very happy about that um but i'm not I don't think I've ever looked at ranking on Amazon, except once when I had a free thing on BookBub and, and um, whatever I was giving away for free surpassed Louise Penny, which I thought was kind of funny. It's like, oh, wow. For 30 seconds, this book was uh, above Louise Penny. Um, but I, it's, and it's really hard in this competitive world to not want to do that. But if you can just get that out of the way, it can be a really fun thing to do. Of course, there are people who need to make money at it, and that's a whole different thing, a whole different track. So you just need to decide early on which track are you on, uh, and and that'll make the whole process a lot more fun if you kind of know ahead of time which track you need to be on. I completely agree with you. I mean, it's like I think that's an extremely healthy attitude you have, not checking your rank all the time, that sort of thing. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. It is, but it's also quite hard to not fall into it, particularly because as a, you know, independent publisher, which is what I am, just like I'm listening to magic podcasts and reading up and stuff, I'm also following writing podcasts such as yours. Um, and you can get into this, oh my goodness, I need to have a huge backlist. I need, I, uh, the thing that just floored me when I first heard about it was, oh, no, I need to uh, rapidly release three books and I need to be writing four books a year. And I thought, wow, if I tried to write four books a year, I would be dead and I wouldn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And having spent 30 some years in the corporate world where I had to sit down and write something, I had to churn it out, whatever it was that we were doing, I had to do it. This is a case where I don't have to do it. And so I don't have to do a certain amount of writing every day. I don't have to put out a number of books every year. I realize and I hear from the Eli Marks fans 
They always love having a new book. I always love sending them a new book. But um, I didn't sign up for <laughs> being the guy who has to give them a brand new book every year. That's just not what I signed up for. Well, to me, that's a very healthy attitude. I'm, I'm glad to hear it <laughs> because. Um, but it's hard to keep that. Comparison, this is something I try yes. to avoid. <laughs> When you hear someone else talk and you hear about, oh, uh, I, I was just listening to the, um, and I probably shouldn't because it's not helping really, I suppose, but the Six Figure Author podcast, I mean, they're very nice people and they have very good advice on there. But when you, you know, they're talking about the amount of money you're supposed to spend every day on advertising. And I thought, I'm, you know, this one person was talking about spending $1,000 a day on advertising. I thought, I'm not doing that. There's That's no way insane. I'm doing that. <laughs> It is insane. And you go, well, you'd make a million a year. Yeah, I'd also not be able to sleep at night. So uh, I, I would rather keep doing what I'm doing. And I know there are people who are far better at doing what I'm doing than I am. Uh, I'm, I've learned a lot and I've made mistakes. Uh, but the fact is that every, every day I sell a handful of books and that's fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up? Um, thanks for having me on. I, I enjoy the podcast. Uh, yeah, this is this has been fun. Well, I've had fun, and um, I just love what you have to say. I think that's fantastic. Um, have you been using the, the the screenwriting stuff you learned to help uh, just uh, in your normal writing? Uh, definitely, screenwriting has helped me with my usual writing. I mean, my yeah. my novel writing. Yeah. 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 It's given me also a great deal of appreciation for IP in general, you know, the mm -hmm. whole concept of intellectual property and the importance of copyright, all that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's the the I, I wish more people would just look into screenwriting just because it teaches you so many great things. You don't really, you really even need to be right, right, reading books on it. Just kind of pay attention as you're watching a movie at, at what point do they get into the scene? At what point do they leave the scene? Uh, I was talking to someone recently who said, uh, oh boy, screenplay writing must be fun because you get to write more dialogue than you'd have in a novel. And I said, well, it's actually just the opposite. There's probably a 10th amount of dialogue in a movie than there is in a novel. You don't have time in a movie for the kind of talking you can do uh, in a novel. And he said, no, are you sure? I said, yeah. I mean, you could, screenplay is 120 pages and just look at the amount of words in it compared to a novel. And it does learn, it, you learn from writing screenplays how to uh, compress and say less and do less and make each line have more impact. In fact, you know, you mentioned the story, the, the short story, The Last Customer that I'm giving away via your blog. And um, that's a five, 6,000 word short story, maybe something like that. And uh, I turned it into uh, uh, an animated piece as you can see from the link. But I also originally that started because I wanted to do it as a comic book which means figuring out all the frames and what's gonna be said in each one. And that is an act of compression that anybody who's writing a short story should try to do, to take a 6,000 word short story and compress down just the dialogue because everything else has to be visualized by your artist. Um, I'd be surprised if 15% uh, of the dialogue made it into the comic book. I had to really, really, really compress it because there just isn't the time or the space. And it, it helps you be a better writer because you you figure out exactly what needs to be said and what doesn't. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. That is so true. And yeah, people do have that misimpression about uh, screenwriting. It is really about, um, it's not about dialogue. It, the it less isn't. dialogue, the better. You know, and, and because of the 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 being in lockdown uh, my wife and I ended up watching a lot more um, mystery series from around the world different Netflix has a lot of really good ones and you you can learn from watching those uh, how to bury things in a mystery how to bury clues because it's very hard to really bury a clue in a in a mini series or particularly in a movie if you have 90 minutes if, you know, if someone uh, is sharpening a knife in the beginning of the movie, you know that knife is gonna turn up uh, as, as an element later on in the movie. You can bury stuff a whole lot easier in a novel 
because you can have so many different kind of red herring things out there. In, in a movie, as you're watching it, once you've written a few mystery novels, and I'm sure you do the same thing, you, you see those red flags as they pop up and you go, oh, yeah, okay. No, it's the sister. Obviously, it's the sister because she just said that thing. Um, and it, it, you, you realize the luxury you have in writing a novel of, of being able to, to uh, bury stuff a whole lot easier. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, well, I want to thank you for being here, John. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. It's been fun. I had a great time talking to you. And um, remember, everyone who's listening, that the Crime Cafe has two ebooks featuring multiple authors who've appeared on the show. You can buy them from all major retailers. You can also get a copy of each if you become a Patreon supporter. So check on check out the Patreon page. All you have to do is click on the Patreon button at the bottom of this uh, podcast and uh, check it out. Our next guest on the show will be David Kushner. In the meantime, take care and happy reading. Mm-hmm.